There's probably not a better opera to start a season with than Mozart's The Magic Flute because it's one of the most popular operas ever written. It's colourful, it's funny, it's moving. It has all the ingredients that make opera great and it leaves the audience very, very happy at the end. So there's no better opera to start a season with than The Magic Flute. Some people think the magic flute is terribly complicated and yet it really is not. It's fundamentally a love story. It's the prince in search of his princess in a sense because Pamina has been snatched away by a person he is told is very evil, that is Sarastro, the husband of the Queen of Night. And it's the Queen of Night who sends him off on the search for Pamina but she has very different motives from those of Sarastro. Sarastro is trying to protect her and teach her about purity and virtue and he wants to make sure that she is only passed on to a man who respects those same qualities. So what we have in the Magic Flute is an attempt by three ladies and the Queen of Night to trick Tamino but he is assisted by that wonderful birdman Papageno to go through all kinds of trials and tortures and finally he comes out at the end in love with Pamina, pure, wholesome, and they are the future of mankind. But then there's the wonderful subtext, the other story about Papageno and Papagena, two bird-like creatures who also find love and romance. So you can look at this opera on so many levels. There are wonderful spiritual levels, there is, there's straight comedy, there's terrific music. It's everything that I think a true comic opera should have, not just laughter, but room for thought as well. Dann wann? Wenn nicht erfreuen, schieß hier die nicht. Ein Mensch zu sein. Wie soll ich jetzt still? Still still. Because it's very beautiful. It looked very beautiful yesterday. So now take her on the shoulder. And hold her to the end. Michael Humper is an old friend of this company now. He's one of the stage directors I've admired all of my career. I've seen a lot of his work in Europe and when we could finally attract him to San Diego as we did a few seasons ago, he delivered first class product to us. We've already seen several productions from him. A Mask Ball, of course, was a huge success, The Barber of Seville and so on. And there are more in the future as well. That's the idea. Right. And she just follows. Yeah? So. Magic Flute basically is a musical. And sometimes I think it should be given as a musical. Which it was at Mozart's times. In that popular theater for which it was written. Which was technically well equipped and many things have to happen. So certainly uh, one of the conditions of designing Magic Flute is that a lot happens for the eye. And the more there are little miracles and, and even if the people see how miracles are done, they are amused by it and uh, visually a lot should happen but they are also very simple, very stark scenes of the Sarastro world which is a spiritual world. Um, there's the world of the Queen of the Night, there's world of Papageno's world which is nature and uh, so all these different aspects have to be brought together in a scenically, visually convincing unity, which is naturally one of the main problems of staging Magic Fluid. One big gesture is in principle always better than five small ones, okay. yes? One gesture says... The musical styles are very different and vary from aria to aria and from, from ensemble to ensemble. And one of the great difficulties naturally of Magic Fluid is to bring all these various characters and accordingly various musical styles into one great unity of humanity.
So we set out to work. I said I will design uh, the scenery myself and also try to create an appropriate frame for Sandra's costumes, which are very elaborate, very uh, well done, as you will see. Being that I spend part of the time in San Diego and the opera is just so wonderful here, I got to know um, Ian Campbell and he eventually said to me, if you're interested, um, I, you've, I know you've never done an opera before, but think about it, here's a tape of, of the opera and would you be interested in doing it? And it was just one of the most wonderful things to be asked in my life because I hadn't been asked to do an opera before. So, and he said he felt it would give complete rein to my imagination, and it has. I must say, I've been so lucky working in the workroom here in um, San Diego, in between productions, we've been lucky enough to have the time and have everyone working towards the whole aim of making something fantastic. Um, we've invented new San Diego, special San Diego feathers that are really fabric with this um, amazing plastic in the back of them so that if um, Michael Hempe, um, when he you know, works with the singers, makes them roll about, um, we hope that the, the player will collapse before the costume. <laughs> and uh, that you can see, look, look at the lovely, how wonderful, look at what they've been doing. This is a snake lady. And she's got all these lovely petals. I mean, they should move wonderfully. Um, you know, we've, it's been very exciting. Do you have to have a look at this one over here, which is is for our lovely bird lady and this is all been all sort of all fringe so although it would look like feathers on the stage it, it it's got such body and i as i said i'm just very lucky that the team that i've been working with are all people who work with the theater and know the way these things can be constructed in a much more strong way than just putting an ordinary dress on and these are all little little, um, see, little rulos, you call them in England. I think they're called spaghetti here, aren't they, girls? Yes, yeah. spaghetti. <laughs> and those have been made to grow up her body, and we've been f making little bird's nests. I mean, they've interpreted my drawings far better than I would have done, so it's fantastic. And she's got, look at her lovely feathers. She's going to move so beautifully. <laughs> The Queen of the Night is going on over there. She's in a boned bodice and she has huge, great swirls. And originally, I invented these swirls, gosh, in 1980 when I did a, a royal collection in gold in London. And this was then worked out from my historic collection. And these are going to be panniers. And then she's going to come down really tiny because she's got to whoosh into some hole in the stage that I'm a bit worried about. But um, I think we're going to manage to do that. The prince is in um, a wonderful um, burnout velvet that has been done in in England that um, is going to be in a crossover jacket. Uh, I think we've got the fabric over here which will be in a very rich it's in a rich um, pale velvet. I mean you know this is very Mozartian. I mean a prince who's going to go into the into the forest like this is quite exotic isn't it? But uh, and without his bow and arrow apparently but I mean, this is, but we're really looking forward to this and he's going to be very jeweled and princely. I had about four preliminary meetings with Michael Hemper first, both in, um, I met him in Germany, I saw him here initially, and then he came to London twice. So we've sort of managed to make our timetable where we both managed to get together 
and um, try and do things that are going to be, they've got to be very original because there's no point if it is an original production that everyone's going to say, this is what San Diego Opera is doing and, and that Ian, I'd like to do more. So of course I'm thrilled to be doing it. And I think we're going to end up with something very, very original and very different. Cellos, yes, okay. Also the cellos, you have to be there. New cellos? I know John Fiore for a very long time, and we have done quite a lot of uh, operas together. So there's a great understanding from the beginning, and no problem at all. And and we just look at each other, or we smile and grin at each other, and we understand each other very well. When I started to conduct, I'm mainly did Italian music, because for conductors starting out and conductors who are guests, you tend to be asked to do the Italian repertoire, Puccini, Verdi, things like this. And the big pieces like the Wagner's and the, and the Strauss's, music directors tend to take for themselves, so they don't tend to be offered too much unless you're a very famous conductor already. So that's what I've been focusing on the last few years when I became a music director in Germany at the Deutsche Oper am Rhein in Dusseldorf where I'm able to finally conduct the Wagner pieces that I've known all my life and have been waiting to do. As far as Mozart is concerned, I, I've done my share of Mozart too. And Mozart is um, certainly more, probably more difficult in certain ways because in the big pieces with huge orchestras, you can cover up a few more things in Mozart, which has to be so precise and is so exposed. And it's, it's like a little jewel. It needs to be absolutely well polished and, and clear for it to really work really well. The first thing I try to do when I'm dealing with a group that I've never seen before is to at least play for a few minutes so we get a feeling for each other and I can get a sense of where the you know, things are that I need to, to do. Then I start to talk about basics, you know, rhythm and dynamics. I'm big on dynamics, most conductors are, but you know, I, try, I try to explain why it's important. Not just say play soft, but to say why one should play soft, because Pamina is feeling this, or this color is happening, and I'm trying to create this atmosphere, and, and to write, find a motivation for it so it's more interesting, not just, you know, piano and forte. Um, and of course in America, because of the time constraints, that you don't have quite as many rehearsals as you might in, in Europe, you have to work very fast and try to be as efficient as you can, which is okay because when there's a little bit of pressure on, I think it makes, you know, makes one sit up more and, and really try and get the work done as efficiently as possible and, and, and there's a feeling of, of drive, and which is good. I love John Osborne because he's, not only is the voice extremely beautiful, but he's a very sophisticated and sensitive artist. I mean, the way he shapes phrases is just really fantastic. And I, I, I really enjoy listening to him sing. I, I, it gives me a rush. A lot of teachers will often give their students Mozart to sing because they think it's very basic. They think, you know, if you can sing Mozart, you can sing anything or that kind. In a way, I, I believe it's ab absolutely the opposite approach. Um, I think that in particular the magic flute, the role of Tamino, I think it takes a certain maturity in your ability to sing. Your, you're really being sound with your vocal technique so that it doesn't get in the way of being the princely person that you are, being able to carry off the drama that is necessary. I think that if you worry about high A flats, you know, what position to sing it in, um, it's very difficult to be convincing as an actor when you're worried about your singing all the time. And so, just in general about singing Mozart, I think it's deceptively difficult. Um, now, as far as singing the role of Tamino, um, it's a really interesting role. It's a role that's grown on me. It's a role that I did when I was in college. 
I did the role originally in English, and uh, there's never a good English, English translation of uh, Italian or German or French opera. And uh, so it's always kind of amusing the way you repeat phrases and stuff. But uh, with the German text, usually it goes more into depth into what you're really talking about and the drama and the plot and everything. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be singing it in German. Obviously, and to sing in German is a lot different than English because for me, German is not my first language. Um, I've studied German quite a bit. I studied it for three years when I was in the Met Young Artist program, and I studied it another year before that in college. And just kind of, I've worked very hard in languages, so you always have to work up your languages to make sure that your singing technique goes along with your your ability to communicate in a foreign language, and uh, in a way that almost makes it uh, native to yourself and to your body and everything that has to do with your singing. Uh, because opera is, well, all of singing is communication, and uh, you have to be able to communicate. And if you can't, then what's the point? <laughs> Over the years, I have, I have seen Jennifer, I have heard about her, and I have worked with her, and just it's always a great pleasure to actually work with such a dedicated artist. Um, I find her to be a, a, a very talented musician as well as a gifted singer, and uh, we really have the ability to listen to each other and to match each other's color and just to make beautiful music. I find that that Mozart comes easy to me, which is just luck of the draw, and I'm not sure why. There's some people that do Rossini and can just run off those, those trills, and I have a much easier time with Mozart coloratura. Now, there isn't a lot in this role. I often do the Countess, Elvira, Pamina, and Constanza, and somehow I find um, the Pamina and the Countess to be the easiest of my Mozart roles, and Fiordalegi is another one. The ones that have enormous coloratura and ha extreme highs and lows are a little harder. And Pamina doesn't have, her range is, it's, this, it's fairly high, but it's not this uh, virtuosic. She's a character that where the soul is much more exposed and, and therefore the, the line is simpler. Um, but it's deceiving, it's not just, it's not so easy to do that, but it's, it's easier for me than some, some roles. Some people play her very, very, very sweet and innocent, and I don't see her that way, and kind of luckily neither does um, Michael Hampa. He immediately said we were not going to have her be so weak. She, she is a victim in some sense, but she's also a very confident young woman. And so she stands up to Manastatos and says, no, I will not love you, even if it means I can escape this terrible situation. And she says to Papageno, if this prince loves me so much, why isn't he here? You know, she's really very forward. Every time I do a Mozart opera, I think this is the most beautiful. And, but I, I, might, I might just think that a little bit more about this one than, than any of the others. It seems more profound. This interpretation of the opera, I'm half bird. Sort of, it's 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 supposed to be that my great 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 grandfather was the the, the, the great griffin or something like that. A bird. Yeah. <laughs> A bird. So I'm half human, half bird, and uh, and uh, because I'm in search for a woman, that's my greatest wish.
That's the one wish I've never had fulfilled. And so the, the priestess, when I meet the priestess of, of the, what would you call it, the priesthood of Sarastro, they use that as, I, I guess, to, to catch me. They say, you can have a woman. We have a good woman for you, a young, nice woman. Uh, but then you have to uh, go through our tests. And the test is I have to, to renounce things that I normally love most. I guess those are the tests that are most important to us. It's kind of weird. The, the, Things that we cult. love most, if we can, <laughs> if we can um, do without them for a while, you know, no coffee for a week. No, it's not that. It's it's no speaking for a while, and Papagino loves to speak, and no no um, no uh, um, no um, um, food, no drink, all that. And, and they, they bring you a woman. Then they bring me a woman, and here she is. But I first appear as a as a really old lady, an old haggard woman. And um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. The, the, thing, the interesting thing about this woman is that I, 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 Papageno mentions that he doesn't have a Papagena yet and thus makes up the name. And from then the, the priests and Sarasso take that name and say, we have a Papagena for you. And, and when and she comes in... And then they send this old lady. And, um, and of course that's not what you had in mind. I think that's another <laughs> test. Yeah. It's another so test to see, to see, does Papageno really deserve uh, a woman? Can he, can he, um, does, does he see beyond the surface, the facade, <laughs> the looks? And why does he deserve a woman? Why do you think they decide? Because he's lonely. Well, <laughs> he doesn't really. He, he failed several times. First she comes in, and then when he thinks that, that, uh, that, uh, that he's got her, then the priests don't think so yet, so they send her away again. It's, it's great agony for him, mm. several times, until the very end. But, it's, but you only agree to marry the old... Papageno only agrees to marry the old lady, because um, otherwise he's going to be um, left there forever, and he'll only be able to have um, water and bread for the rest of his life. <laughs> and then he says, OK, I'll marry you then. Yes. <laughs> I'd rather then, take this old hag than... Then put up with then wine, put up with all I mean, this, water, with water and, 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 and confinement for the rest of my life. And then the old lady transforms into Papagena, the ideal bird woman for Papageno. I had to play around a bit for the voice of the old lady for something that really sounded really old and cartoonish and sort of cranky. But um, but I I actually I wore my voice up for doing that. I do my vocal exercises before I do that so that I don't hurt it because in the first rehearsals I was a bit sore afterwards so I thought, hmm, okay. So it's fine now. It's always a big chance to come with all, all the ideas. I always, I always have a lot of ideas for a role, then come and then meet a director who has uh, twice as many ideas about my <laughs> role. And, uh, and good ones too, unfortunately, so I had to, to stuff most of my own ideas. And okay, so okay, he's in many respects, he's right. And um, so that has been great, but uh, also a challenge to kill your own darlings, as they say, and, and, and take on something else. Um, but there is also, I think, the biggest challenge of Papagin is to play him. I mean, the, it is also a big role to sing, but it's, uh, it's, the singing is not so challenging. It's very straightforward music. So, I guess the, the big challenge is to, to play him. The Magic Flute is a fantasy opera. Um, it can be done many, many different ways. You can set it in almost any time period, any place, any location that you want. And I think it works under those circumstances. So in all the many productions that I've done in my career, and I would say I've probably done close to 100 performances of maybe, I would say, two dozen productions over my career, I've done it a number of different ways. I've, I've done it straight, where I'm a um, kind of a high priest 
almost in an Egyptian kind of style. I've played him where he's almost like Ming the Terrible from the old Flash Gordon series. I've played him where it's actually set in a, uh, an American Indian style production where I'm kind of a tribal chief. I've done it in a Hawaiian production style where I've been in a grass skirt. And in this particular production, I think it's probably the wildest or the most outrageous that I've ever done. Um, he comes out in this very, very bright orange costume with this equally bright orange wig, which a lot of people have said I, I remind them of Billy Idol, I guess, singing the role of Zoroastro. <laughs> But uh, I'm very excited to do it in this kind of a production because it, uh, it really brings out the fantasy, I think, in the opera. And uh, I, I'm very excited about being a part of that. So. The music and the role of, of Zoroastro is one of the more unusual roles, I guess. It, it shows off the bass voice uh, at the bottom end of the range more often than you would normally hear in many opera productions. There's quite a bit of low singing. It goes down to a, uh, a sustained low F a number of times uh, with an optional E, which I take at the end of the second aria, which not all basses do. But if you've got the note, I say, hey, go for it. So I do it. But um, it, my favorite number, I think, in the piece would be the first aria that Sorastro sings, which is the, uh, the noble prayer, Oasis Untosiris. Um, George Bernard Shaw once commented upon hearing the magic flute and hearing this particular opera, he said that particular aria is worthy of coming out of the voice of God. It is one of the most noble things I've ever heard. So I've always thought of that uh, quote when I sing that particular, that particular number in the opera. So I would say that that probably is my, my most favorite moment in the opera and it gets to sh really show off the beauty of the, the legato bass voice, which you really get a chance to do in opera. I think principally, of course, the reason any opera remains popular is because the music is so fantastic. This one happens to have some of the most inspired music of any, any piece, and just a wealth of it, and interesting combinations from three rather manipulative ladies to a very nasty queen to a very warm bass leader to three little boys so it's just a, and little animals who come on stage. There's everything in this opera for everybody and you know it's just and a fantastic overture to start it all off. I mean what more could you want? <laughs>